Shall we get started? Give me a thumbs up. Is my audio working? Is that good? Can you all hear me?
for a comment, I guess. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Stacy Clardy. I'm an autoimmune neurologist at the University of Utah and at the Salt Lake City VA um, here in Utah. I'm a transplant uh, originally from the East Coast by way of Rochester, Minnesota for one year. And I've been here in Utah for about uh, seven and a half years now. Um, and it's been fantastic, right? I uh, adore the lifestyle. I had never been to Utah before I interviewed, but um, you'd be hard pressed to yank me out nowadays. For anybody who's been here, I think you know um, how beautiful it is. And it's also a fantastic place uh, to be a neurologist, um, especially a rare disease neurologist. Um, our catchment area here at the University of Utah, so the referral base for patients is actually over 10% of the continental U.S., so we um, see patients, we are the only academic medical center for about five states. So we see patients from Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah. Um, we see some from uh, Eastern Nevada, Western Colorado, Northern Arizona. So that's a little bit um, about me. Um, my training in fellowship was um, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester um, with mentors, Vanda Lennon, Sean Piddock, Andrew McKeown. Um, and many of you will know that's, of course, where the aquaporin-4 um, autoantibody was discovered and, and the pieces were put together for uh, the aquaporin-4 bit about NMO. Uh, MOG is, of course, still in progress. Um, so before we get in too far, I really do want to thank you um, for letting me talk to you today. Um, this series um, is brought to us. Uh, it's obviously the Samara Foundation for NMO, which you're, you're all familiar Um host this expert uh, Facebook Live series, but it is sponsored as well um, by Viela Bio. And Viela Bio is probably a, a company name you've all learned in the last year. They are dedicated to the development and commercialization of novel and life-changing therapies, especially in the rare disease and autoimmune uh, space. Um, and they really do target um, patients uh, that other companies do not target um, smaller numbers in rare disease. So. Thank you to both uh, Samara, the Samara Foundation, and Viella. So let's hop in. Um, somebody said that's a heck of a commute for patients. It is. Um, so telehealth, for, here in Utah, telehealth has been wonderful. And um, my patients are already brokering deals for post-pandemic for how often they might actually have to come in person. And I'm happy to do that. Um, I, during the pandemic, before the pandemic, I actually started getting licenses, and I'm now licensed in in uh, six Western states so that we can continue to make it convenient for them um, and really only need to bring them in person um, as, uh, as little as possible, but still to keep things safe. So, all right, let's talk about um, prednisone or um, more broadly corticosteroids. Um, let's, let's start by even saying, you know, what are we talking about? Because we always use this word steroids, right? Um, and from a medical point of view, and also sort of uh, what does the public think you're talking about when you tell your friends and family you're on steroids, it is important to differentiate, right? Because we just use this term steroids. And so there are um, anabolic steroids, and that's not what we're talking about, right? This is what folks um, might use somewhat illegally at the gym uh, for bodybuilding. These are the sex hormones. And so we're not talking about those, right? That would be things like the androgens, testosterone, stuff like that. But that is a point of confusion sometimes. Um, certainly when I'm chatting with patients and I'm like, we're going to put you on a short-term steroid and they're, <laughs> I don't want to get big and bulky. <laughs> um, so we're talking more about um, the the natural, well, the sex hormones are naturally occurring too, but these are naturally occurring um, hormones that are made by the adrenal cortex, not related to the sex hormones. And so terms you'll hear thrown around are corticosteroid, glucocorticoid, and mineral corticoid, right? And, and corticosteroid and glucocorticoid really clinically um, are used somewhat interchangeably. Um, there's small niche differences that, you know, uh, people who are really into, um, you know, adrenal cortex and biochemistry will talk to you about. But for all intensive purposes, most of you have been placed or are familiar with glucocorticoids, corticosteroids. And so the, the list of those that you might have heard of includes prednisone, methylprednisolone. Um, uh, if it's a skin thing, you know, some, some skin creams like clobetazole. 
um, triamcinolone, all of these are in that same family, but they're different routes of administration, right? When we're talking about NMO, we're usually talking about an oral high dose or an IV high dose. Um, but certainly in other fields, these can be administered intranasally. If anybody's ever had allergy, allergies, they've probably been on like fluticasone or things like that, all in the same class of medications designed to bring down inflammation, right? Um, so that's what we're talking about. <laughs> um, and, and many of you have much more familiarity because you've lived um, through the pros and cons of these medications. And I think probably we should set the tone by saying, right, these medications can do amazing things in terms of preventing or um, bringing to a stop an attack of, of um, uh, autoimmune conditions, but they really do need to be respected. Um, and I'm sure many of you have also experienced that, that um, you know, within medicine, we're all in our boxes, right? And so while us neurologists use these medications a lot and they can be life-saving for our patients, we're not endocrinologists, right? Endocrinologists are, are specialists who are expert on all the naturally occurring and exogenous hormones, right? Uh, and steroids, things like that. And so this is an area of disconnect, right? This, this can become a challenge. Um, neurologists really, this is probably an area for us to work on and continue to remind ourselves um, of the importance of discussing the downsides of these medications, right? We know the, pl the pros, right? You know this, you, many of you have experienced or seen uh, your loved one experience that they get placed on one of these medications and an attack slows down, it may recover attack. Sometimes when we, especially more historically, would use these long-term, it was for attack prevention. We still do this sometimes. Um, we should be doing this less and less in NMO. So let's talk about that too, before we get too much further in, what is the role of corticosteroids in neuromyelitis optica, either MOG or aquaporin-4? Um, well, when I started um, treating NMO, um, you know, probably about 10 years ago in residency, um, corticosteroids, they played a very important role um, because um, we really didn't have ready access to infusions like rituximab and, and now the three um, new medications, two infusions, one injectable, um, to prevent attacks. And so we had to use corticosteroids and lean on them a lot more, um, both for attack and for, uh, for attack mitigation and prevention. So I can recall a time when more of the mainstays of our therapies, at least for the aquaporin-4 NMO, were azathioprine and mycophenolate mofetil, and those are pills. One of the downsides of those two off-label therapies we used to use a lot was that they don't become effective at suppressing the immune system for about three to four months of taking them every day. And so many of our patients, just to get on a preventative medication, had a three to four month lead in of daily prednisone because we needed to bridge them with prednisone until those pills, the preventatives, azathioprine, mycophenolate, mofetil, became effective. And so, so many patients, you know, who received an NMO diagnosis were already signed up for three to four months of oral prednisone. And, and you all, I don't need to tell this audience that that came with a lot of side effects. Now that we have these newer treatments, that is becoming less common, at least in the States. Um, and that is actually one reason, probably at least in my practice, that I don't use those as much because I don't like to expose my patients to that three to four month prednisone lead-in and all the side effects that can come with it. So we've already, with the new therapies, gotten away from that, but still, um, sometimes we are forced to um, use prednisone for longer periods of time than we would like. Um, there are many situations clinically when, when I've been forced into it, um, uh, certainly um, with some of my undocumented or underinsured patients while trying to gain them access to other free drugs. We've had to go with this long term or some of, um, some of our, our homeless NMO population where this is really the only sort of safe, reliable thing we can get them and send them out with. Um, so it still comes up and it, of course, will always come up with relapses. Um, so, um, yeah, so let's talk about it. There are things we can do to minimize the side effects, right? And, and it pays to be educated about these before you have to go on them or before you have to go on them again, as the case may be. So, um, there are, th I always, when I prescribe prednisone, tell my patients, you're getting this pill, but it comes with three friends, three other pills. If I'm going to place them on a dose 
um, that's higher than the equivalent of 20 milligrams of prednisone, which all the infusions automatically blow away, but higher than 20 milligrams of prednisone and longer than 10 days, they get three friends to go with that prednisone. And those are um, a, a prevention and, and mitigation strategy. So what are those three things? One of them is double strength Bactrim given three times a week, Monday morning, Wednesday morning, Friday morning, can be taken with other pills. And that is for prevention of a very unusual type of pneumonia uh, called pneumocystis. Um, and so that gets us into one of the side effects, infection, right? These calm down your immune system, but they put you at high risk of infection. So um, that's one thing that we do to try and prevent that infection that we know you're especially susceptible to um, while taking prednisone. Number two is bone health protection. So what does prednisone do? It prevents the bones from adequately absorbing calcium and sort of the downstream things, vitamin D as well, that go with it. And if you're on this for any sort of long period of time, you can get osteopenia, osteoporosis, if you're on them chronically, um, you know, really uh, just sort of heartbreaking um, fractures that can occur just spontaneously without even falling or set you up for, for sort of all of this lifelong. So calcium and vitamin D if we're, if we're on a short course. And this, this can be a whole lecture in and of itself because there are many ways to prevent osteopenia and osteoporosis. And a lot of them depend on how long the steroid course will be, either acutely or cumulatively, your age, and then your pre-existing bone health going in. So this is a very dis different discussion with my 18-year-olds than it is with my 65-year-olds, right? Um, and different strategies um, for, for how to prevent the bone loss. And then the third one, which is controversial, um, is uh, for some of my patients, I will put them on um, stomach protection, like things like you think of over-the-counter Prilosec, a PPI, what we call it, Prilosec, ranitidine, those kind of things. And, and that is certainly indicated in patients who are taking um, over-the-counter NSAIDs, like Advil and things like that, or who have had a history of gastritis, gastric ulcers, um, it's a bit more controversial if that really needs to be done for short courses in, in anyone who hasn't had a history of a gastritis or inflammation of the stomach lining. Um, but, but those three are always on my mind. Many of my patients, at, at least 50%, I would say, end up on, on the stomach protection medicine as well. So that really becomes burdensome, right? Because now I prescribed you one medication and you're taking four. <laughs> Um, but but those are that that's essential, and I do spend time on that with my patients to explain to them that we're trying to prevent problems with prednisone. Does that prevent all of them? No, because the other ones, um, and again, I, you know, talking to this group, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, right? Um, other side effects: um, if you're on them chronically at um, a moderate to high dose, you can develop a Cushingoid type syndrome, Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome. You can Google this. This, uh, you know, and you'll see these pictures come up. If you go on Google images, you see these pictures come up affecting almost every system in the body. They sort of have that, you know, the, the human figure. And then they point to all the systems saying what Cushing syndromes can do, right? This is where you can kind of get that little hump of, of what looks like, like a buffalo hump back by your neck. Um, of course, bone loss, mood changes, thin skin or stretch marks. Um, thinning of hair, um, uh, affecting sort of, you know, uh, tons more systems than that. Again, a separate lecture, but we really have to watch out for this if we're going to be leaving you on chronic doses um, and, and try to prevent it. Other things, it's going to increase your cholesterol. So if I have exposed you to steroids, you know, on multiple occasions, more than one occasion in the last few years, um, I sort of put on my primary care hat, right? And then when I'm drawing your labs for NMO and drug monitoring, I also might throw on a lipid profile. I might throw on, um, to check that cholesterol and, and, and get you on a treatment, I might throw on a hemoglobin A1C because that's the other big thing that everybody knows here um, is that we can unmask or create a diabetes. So if you were at all on the brink of being at risk for, for a metabolic diabetes and we throw a little bit of a prednisone at you for a period of time, it's not rare or unusual that we tip you over into being diabetic, especially for our chronic steroid patients, right? And so we need to watch this. Um, and there's, you know, again, strategies to prevent this. A lot of these are the hard work. When I put someone on prednisone, I say, look, lock the fridge. You're going to get the munchies acutely and any ca extra calories you put in, you're keeping right? 
The, the calories you won't keep are the water weight when the face gets puffy. So that goes away when we can lower the doses. But any extra food you eat has to be, you have to lose that weight the hard way. And it has these metabolic effects. We know we're sort of setting you up to be more hungry and to put on extra fat when we do that. Um, so I do, I mean, I jokingly say it, but I literally say, walk, you know, lock the fridge, count calories, get an app, do whatever you can, because you will be hungry all the time. Um, so um, that's a little bit, let me, you know, I, I see tons of stuff popping up in the chat here. So should we start at the bottom and, and go um, backwards? What does a small dose of steroids be taking daily? That's a relative um, kind of question. Um, you know, there is... Um, there is a sense, so these studies have not been done in NMO. What dose of prednisone is protective in NMO? This is all done by expert opinion, right? So you take that for what it's worth. But before we had these medications, when we were forced into this situation a lot, I will tell you that I and many of my mentors and colleagues, a dose of prednisone that we would sometimes put someone at while we were waiting for access to drug, while we were waiting for mycophenolate and azathioprine to take effect was 20 milligrams daily. And, and we arrived at that, you know, frankly, by patient experiences. Sometimes you put somebody on 10 and they had an attack. You know, you put them on 40 and they had so many side effects they couldn't take it sort of thing. And so 20 was a bit of a sweet spot. And, and I will tell you still my daily practice, not with just NMO, but other autoimmune conditions. You know, when I'm talking to my fellows, I do say 20 sometimes is that kind of magic dose, but that's not a low dose for side effects, right? It, especially if we're talking over weeks, right? At 20 milligrams over weeks to months, you will accumulate some of these um, adverse effects, no doubt about it. But that is probably the dose where if I'm trying to prevent an NMO attack while bridging or doing something else, that's the lowest I will go, uh, is a 20 milligram daily. Um, but, um, but it, you know, again, that, there's no science behind that. There's no prospective trial. There never will be, right? Because hopefully now with these new drugs, we don't have to do that as often. That's really something I learned and that I sort of pass on and, and works for most. Um, let's kind of start scrolling up here. Another one while I'm scrolling up here that I forgot to mention here, but I say to all of my patients first is, and this is the one that keeps me up at night, the acute rare side effect of something called avascular necrosis. This can happen at any dose of steroids, at any point during the steroid course, anytime we put someone on um, prednisone or the equivalents, the glucocorticoids and corticosteroids. That is, you can give someone this medication, they can get something called avascular necrosis, which means the, the blood supply feeding your bone, most commonly the femur. So, you know, the femur looks like this, it's a long bone and then the, the round part. There's really only one prominent vessel going in there. And for some reason, rarely that vessel closes up when we put some people on steroids and it's an automatic hip replacement. Similar thing can also happen with the vasculature supplying the knee and it's an automatic knee replacement. So this one really terrifies me, right? There's nothing like having an attack of NMO, getting through that and then needing to go to surgery for a hip replacement. And certainly any of us who have been in the business long enough have had this happen to at least one or two patients among our hundreds. So I tell people about that right away. Um, I hate to say it to patients because I see the sort of the color drain out of their face. I'm like, but you have to know, right? You have to know that it is what it is. Um, we don't, we can't predict who it's going to happen to. It's a risk. And so then they tell me if it, it really just presents as an aching in that hip that's persistent and won't go away. So it's, it's sort of a sneaky presentation too. It can take months to diagnose if you're not looking out for it. Um, so Let's get that one out of the way. I, you know, it's one of those things where you're, you're like, thanks, thanks, doc, for telling me, right? Because there's nothing we can do to prevent it and nothing, but, but be aware of that, right? Again, steroids need to be respected. Um, and, and I don't want to say fear, just respected because they are amazing miracle drugs for some of our patients, but this all comes with it. Um, oh, wanting to know dosage of vitamin D and calcium. Um, I always have to write these out. I have these little smart phrases sort of in my um, chart because I can never remember. I don't, I'm not sure of the pediatric dose. Um, and so actually when the other piece I'm not saying here is I often will refer when you get beyond these three basics I was telling you about, or if the steroid course, if I know in advance, it's going to be a long course, um, or somebody's already come to me on a long course, I phone a friend, I call endocrinology. And in that consult, I placed endocrinology. It's a bulleted list. I will say, I've checked the hemoglobin A1C. I don't like where it's at. They're at risk for diabetes. This is a, you know, 
40-year-old female. She's been exposed to steroids for greater than six months cumulatively. Let's do bone health. I want a DEXA scan, you know, or ha has that person had any fractures, um, either sort of um, provoked fractures like an actual accident or spontaneous fracture. And then I'll also put, you know, I have a to-do list. As you know, with NMO, I'll, there's also accompanying autoimmunity in many of our patients. So I'll say, hey, by the way, manage that thyroid for me too. So I give the endocrinologist to do list. I, I call them in because this warrants a full visit, right? At my visit, I'm talking about NMO and neurologic and all of this kind of stuff. So right as soon as I get beyond one issue where I know it's going to be prolonged steroids or it already has been, I call in the endocrinologist as part of the team because they, again, right, not surprising, they can spend a full hour going over all of this. Um, so, and there are, there are very complex decision matrix and a lot of data informing who gets what prevention for osteoporosis, right? I talk about calcium and vitamin D, but there are multiple layers after that. Hormonal therapies, monoclonal therapies to rebuild bone, you know, many of you are probably familiar with these. And that gets very complex and above the expertise of the average neurologist, right? What I want is the note back from the endocrinologist saying, I did the assessment. This is what they qualify for. We've started it. And then, we, you know, the patient I have to visit, I ask him, check. Great. So we're doing that. Is it working okay? Because, um, again, those medications have their own sort of list of side effects. There's actually a calculator that I found when I was sort of digging around, thinking about this talk today, um, called the FRAX, F-R-A-X calculator. So you can do some of this if you want to by yourself. And it asks you your age, your sex, your weight, your height, any previous fractures, um, you know, uh, it, all kind of risk factors. You put them into this calculator. It's, it's, uh, it's out of the UK, out of Sheffield, but FRAX. If you Google FRAX fracture, you can actually do a bit of this yourself to see what you should be doing, where you're at, sort of in the, in the risks. Uh, stratification. So I, I would suggest that um, it, it is informative. And then the docs will also have by age and sort of the questions they're asking you, basically doing the same thing, but ultimately they're kind of just mimicking that FRAX calculator. Um, and there is some much, uh, much better prospective data because obviously um, millions of people are placed on prednisone for, for indications other than rare diseases. Um, so um, I was trying to, okay. So I looked it up to make sure I was doing the right thing in the literature. This can't, comes from the rheumatologic literature, again, where they use a lot of prednisone and they have a sort of a, a working group that meets every couple of years to reassess. So for adults, you want um, calcium 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day. I'm giving you the units because we have different countries here. So basically a minimum of 1,000 milligrams per day. And for the vitamin D, which I use D3, uh, I think it's much better absorbed uh, in our populations, uh, six to 800, what they call international units daily. So IU. Um, and so you need a minimum of that. And then some people end up needing additional vitamin D because we spend so much time indoors and, and we don't actually get enough to be sufficient. So again, another thing that I check when I'm checking lipids is a vitamin D level. Um, this is also an area where we have to be careful. Multiple sclerosis neurologists aim for super therapeutic vitamin D levels in their patients because there's a body of literature supporting that MS patients have fewer attacks at super therapeutic vitamin D. I wanna be clear here, there is not similar literature in NMO. So I do not aim for super therapeutic levels in NMO patients, different disease, different chemistry, different biology. I aim for sufficiency, which is in the States, usually is a, it's measured differently in different places, but a level of 30 might sound familiar to most of you. The MS patients, they go for a blood level of 50, 80, 90. Don't do that with NMO patients. MS patients, yes, but not NMO. And so again, you have to be careful with your neurologist. We sometimes have a tendency to lump, but we have that literature in MS. That literature so far has not been replicated in an NMO. And it may, um, because vitamin D is actually a hormone, we do have to be careful. It's, it's not like the more the merrier, right? Same thing with any vitamins. It's not the more the merrier. We have to be careful. These are actual substances that are not entirely benign all the time. The, the other analogy here is B12. You pee out any extra. So if my patients have extra B12, I don't care. But if they're taking a B complex, they accumulate extra B6, they get toxic, right? So we have these very careful discussions in my clinic. B complex, not the same as B12. Vitamin D2, not the same as D3. You know, goal levels do matter. When you get to high levels of vitamin D in the blood, you put yourself at risk for other things like kidney stones. All right, but we digress a little bit. So that's the dose for adults. It is adjusted downward for pediatrics. I know this from my own children. I think it's about, for children, 
for all children, I think American Academy of Pediatrics puts it around 400 IU, I think, but definitely check um, with the pediatrician. They'll have the doses sort of memorized. Um, I see, yes, type 1 here. Yes, there's a lot of type 1 diabetes, right, in NMO because of the, the tendency and the type of autoimmunity that, that causes NMO. And certainly I have, again, I've been at this long enough. It doesn't matter that you warn the patients. It still happens. I have put somebody in the hospital with diabetic ketoacidosis, his first ever sort of high, high sugars because we had to put him on a 60 milligram of prednisone a day for a different condition. Um, and I felt awful about it. I was glad he knew. I was glad we talked about it, but it happened and it happened very quickly. So again, have to be very careful. Um, torn ligaments. Yes, yes, right. The torn ligaments go along with the bone health, right? If your bone health starts to degrade, then the ligaments that are attached to those bones can be at higher risk of, of absorbing the stress. The bones are passing through to them. You can get torn ligaments, just like you know we, we're more familiar with with certain antibiotics setting you up for that. Prednisone can absolutely set you up for that. Um, 12 years of daily steroids, I've had nothing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for sharing that. You know, And it's not too late, right? So hopefully you are seeing an endocrinologist now because when you get to this stage, which is really the severe stage of osteoporosis where you're fracturing by just looking the wrong way, they have bone building medications and they have multiple ones. That's important because some of these aren't tolerated well. So, or, or if they're oral and you get a gastritis because of all that prednisone, they do have infusions. And so it is important to explore with someone who knows this in and out, you know, because they're coming up with more and more of these every year. So again, neurologists, I don't have all the new ones memorized. I'm aware that there are new and better medications coming out to build bone every year but I send them to my endocrinology friend and say, which one is the best one for my patients? You prescribe them all the time, you know the side effects. Here's what we're dealing with. NMO patient with ABC comorbidity, please get them some help. Um, so, so still hopefully, I mean, that's a lot of pain and suffering, but not too late. Hopefully they can start to build a little more bone back. Um, and Cushing's like facial hair, moon hair. Yes, you're describing all the Cushing stuff I left out. Um, cannot get below 20 milligrams without a relapse. Yeah, again, this is the 20 milligrams we really arrived at from our patients. That's what I'm telling you. There was no study, nothing in the lab. It's the patient saying, I go below 20, I can have an attack. Um, you know, the best solution is, and this can be challenging, is to try to get on one of our other NMO medications. This gets challenging in other countries, but, but you know, I, I you know, perhaps, um, and again, it's you know a separate discussion. Is it MOG? Is it Aquaporin 4? Which one works better for most? But the best approach to try and keep pursuing, in addition to the preventatives that we talked about, the antibiotic, the um, calcium and vitamin D, um, and uh, the you know stomach protection if needed, is to try to transition to another medication. And again, azathioprine, mycophenolate, mofetil, these have been around for so long, they are available in most countries now at a, at a reasonable price, not some of these medical bankruptcy kind of prices. So um, very important. All right, I'm still scrolling backward here, but feel free to type any other questions. Oh, asking about the K2. <laughs> yeah, I'm not an expert about that. I, I've read about it. Um, and again, this is, you know, this is a question for the endocrinal, I, you know, I'd be super impressed, like gold star to your neurologist, if they regularly prescribe the K2. I usually do leave this to the endocrinologist because this is an emerging literature. This is an area of emerging literature. It does seem that K2 actually can enhance your ability to absorb the calcium and vitamin D. So maybe they should be given as sort of a, a, a triple therapy together. Um, I do leave that to the endocrinologist because the data is still emerging. There is some reasonable data, but it hasn't been put to that, at least that I've seen a large, really randomized trial. Um, it's more anecdotal now and based on the bench science, right, that, that shows that K2 is helping, at least in the, what we call in vitro situation. Um, so so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure is the answer there. Stay tuned on that one is probably the answer. And certainly the endocrinologists are gonna no more than me. I feel like I'm putting on this like disclaimer, like not an endocrinologist, just really good friends with some really great endocrinologists. <laughs> um, but but it is something to consider, right? Anything we can do um, that we think is safe, and and safety is the key here. Remember, if you're on that proton pump inhibitor or those medicines to prevent gastritis, not only preventing gastritis, you are also preventing absorption of other medications and essential nutrients um, from your diet. So you see how we make 
problems. Pre prednisone, we give it, we solve a big problem, but boy, it, we just start rolling down the hill um, and gathering other problems. So that's the other thing. If a patient is requiring those proton pump inhibitors, the stomach protection for the gastritis, or the H2 blockers, similarly, now I have to check their B12, their vitamin D, their iron, and sometimes other micronutrients if they have a superimposed um, malabsorption syndrome. And we have to start replacing those one by one. Um, again, because it's with all of this, this is hormones, this is chemistry. Sometimes if you're missing one piece, you get into trouble with the others. So um, that's another thing that I will check the labs on. I will replace those individually for my patients if it starts really, again, looking like I'm not having good effect off to the endocrinologist. Um, what can we do for crunchiness of neck and popping sound of joints, especially the neck? Well, I will tell you, when you have a crunching sound in your neck, I have this as well. Some of this is just aging. And I actually brought this up to, you know, sort of uh, physician colleague friends. You know, I can hear my knees crunching, uh, going down the steps, that kind of thing. If there is no pain associated with that, that is benign. And that is actually something aging wise, right? <laughs> a separate issue from bone health. The way to really know the status of your bone health is to get a DEXA scan usually to start. It's an x-ray survey of a few different parts of the body where they look to see what the actual bone density is, right? So good objective data. Um, and they do have um, criteria for who qualifies for a DEXA scan. Probably everyone listening to this is going to loosely meet those criteria best because you've been exposed to some prednisone. Um, and that DEXA scan gives us the objective data as a starting point. Okay. Do you have bone loss already? How bad is the bone loss? And then they will put you into different categories, risk benefit of any medication, right? Like no bone loss, great work, but you think you're gonna need more prednisone, calcium and vitamin D, and they'll follow that way. You know, or already osteopenia, which is the middle ground between sort of normal and osteoporosis. So showing some bone loss, but not severe, then they're gonna to talk to you about different strategies, right? Some of this is actually stuff you can do too, which is, you know, exercise. We, you know, there's good data showing that the weight bearing exercise regularly can help with this as well as the calcium and vitamin D, getting the good nutrient rich diet, checking your other micronutrient levels. Um, here we go. Um, so yeah, the crunchiness by itself, don't worry about it. <laughs> Cause if it doesn't hurt, there's, there's nothing we can do. So I just kind of chuckle and say, well, that's a nice little badge that I'm aging and, and there you go. But if there's pain with it, obviously it has to be investigated. Um, but otherwise, sort of normal arthritis is usually what causes the, 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 the crunchiness, which is to say little bone spurs. So, you know, our joints are supposed to go like this. And as we age and use them, we get these little extra bits of calcium and stuff here. And that's what makes the little crunches. So um, by itself, hopefully benign. Hopefully that's good news. <laughs> My 18 mod positive daughter relapsed shortly after quick steroid tapers. Second round of Oh, um. This is a good question. Um, we don't have great prospective answers on MOG yet, right? So what I say is MOG is the new Aquaporin 4. We are now with MOG where we were with Aquaporin 4 10 to 15 years ago, right? And so all of us, if it's, you know, in this field of autoimmune neurology said, you know, wonderful, thank you to pharma, everybody, all the patients for supporting these three trials. We've got these three great medications. Um, we'll continue to work more on the other atypical stuff for aquaporin 4, like immune tolerance therapy, things like that. But now we need to do the same thing for MOG. Let's get some trials. Let's get some effective drugs. And it does appear, at least preliminarily, they're going to be different drugs, right? You all know this. If you have MOG, the, 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 the medications that people with aquaporin 4 swear are working beautifully for them, it's not necessarily the same story with MOG. Um, so that's a bit of a challenge. Now, what dose would you start at? That's a discussion with your doc. It really is. Or do you have the option to switch to something? And again, keep in mind, it's a lot of anecdotal. So I would go in, um, be up to date on the literature. Um, there's not a ton. It's all still retrospective. But for example, there's a great paper by a uh, colleague Chen, Chen et al. He's a neuro-ophthalmologist at Mayo that just came out recently looking at how patients did in a multi-center review with MOG. I would encourage you to have a look at that and discuss that paper with your doc um, when you're looking at the next approach. Um, that would be just sort of maybe a starting point, a good jumping off point for discussion of what do we do? Do we go back to steroids? Do we try something else? Um, you know, knowing again, steroids are great short term. Um, they've helped us long term, but if we can avoid it, replace them with a steroid sparing immunotherapy, um, it, it's better. Um, my prof asked for a DEXA scan in August. I'm still waiting. 
Yeah. Yeah, you definitely, you know, especially if you've had exposure to prednisone and, and, um, and you have spondylosis in your neck and you're age 60, I would hope that that's going to get approved quickly, a DEXA scan. I do think that's, that's reasonable. And again, it gives you data, right? Because we all worry about this when we've been exposed to steroids. But, you know, it has to be a data-driven approach to be the best care. And so get that DEXA scan. Should it be more than calcium and vitamin D? Should, you know, do you, do you qualify for some of the more aggressive therapies? Um, <laughs> another person waiting oh, um, um, for bone density scan. Um, you know, it, we could have a separate talk on strategies to, to get these things through the system too, right? Um, so, so much of our time is spent in this field on the phone with insurance companies or devising strategies to get prompt care. Um, I'm on rituximab a year ago. You guys are asking me questions. I ask your doc, but um, that's a reasonable question to ask your doc. The question is I'm on rituximab a year ago and prednisone 10 milligrams. The doctor can stop prednisone question mark. Reasonable question, I would ask them. Um, yeah, in many cases uh, that is done. The prednisone is stopped, but you, you may have special exceptions I don't know about, so definitely ask the doc. Um, would you suggest steroid use with Inspring? If so, at what dose? Um, well, you know, the point of all these new therapies is to avoid prednisone, right? So, so um, this is an opinion question. Again, definitely have these in-depth discussions with your specialist. But the point is, at least the way I approach the use of these new medications, so the new medications approved for aquaporin-4, right? So um, inebolizumab, which is a CD19 uh, medication, um, eclizumab, which is a complement inhibitor, and satralizumab, which is an IL-6 monoclonal, the point of all of them when, when I approach their use is that they should be steroid-sparing immune therapies, meaning if I put a patient on them, I'm doing it so they don't have to be on any corticosteroids. Um, at, the, at the outset, um, I will sometimes, and again, this is anecdotal, this is, you know, that, that dangerous old expert opinion, um, I will sometimes leave them on a, a prednisone taper until a couple weeks after um, the infusion just to be sure, because some of them, with the, especially with the CD19 and CD20 monoclonal antibodies, it takes a week or two for maximum B cell depletion. And so um, I will sometimes leave the steroid and sort of taper it off after we know that biochemically we've achieved um, the maximal B cell depletion, which we use as an analogy to say antibody, pathologic antibody depletion, right? Um, any other questions, thoughts? This is great. <laughs> I have a feeling I might have missed some some higher up, so please do um, retype it if, if if we didn't address it. Um, let's see what else. So let's let's go back. There's so much more I know I didn't didn't cover. Oh, prednisone withdrawal too. Yeah. So when you do come off that prednisone, don't do it too quickly. This is something where um, I often say to the patients, your primary care doc is going to think I'm nuts with the taper schedule I'm giving you, but I give very prolonged, slow tapers of prednisone, really basing the length of that taper on what the initial high dose was and how long the patient's been on it. Um, because what happens with these medications is we're giving you a synthetic, a mimic of a, an a hormone that your body naturally makes, right? And so your body stops making it. If you've been on uh, the medication long enough, your body has shut down manufacturing, right? Because it doesn't need to manufacture. It's very smart. It will shut down. And so if I'm going to take you off that, if I stop you overnight, we can send you sort of into almost what we call an adrenal crisis. But at the very least, we'll give you bad withdrawal. Um, and so you're going to have headache. You're going to have fatigue. You could have vomiting. You could have a low blood pressure. You could have nausea. You could have fever. So we're very careful. There's no hurry, right? Once you've been exposed to the prednisone, you've already got the side effects. So I'm not gonna quick switch, flip a switch and take you from 40 down to nothing. Um, now it's a bit different if you've only been on a five day course, right? Again, your body didn't have time to shut down. So that's when we don't do tapers. If you get those, you know, dose those solumedrol dose packs or the five day methyl prednisolone infusion, we don't do the taper then, but you've been on prolonged prednisone. Um, I, I will actually, actually often leave this in the hands of my patients. I will give them some fives. I will give them some one milligrams. And I will tell them sort of, I'd like you roughly off the prednisone. I think a reasonable goal is, you know, I'm making this up, like three months. 
and I will say, and I will outline for them how I would do it, but I will say, if you start getting those symptoms, if you, you know, if you have a big event coming up on this one weekend, hold your taper a couple of days before, and then go back down again, you know, the day after, because every time you have a dose increment decrease, you will tend to feel one to two days of fatigue, mild symptoms that aren't quite withdrawal, but just noticing that you're not having that prednisone on board anymore, sort of the the energizing effects of it, right? So so again, do, you know, maybe discuss with your doc if they're saying, ah, oh, you can just stop that. Um, even, you know, like a 20, which is maybe a, on the lower end of dosing 20 daily. But if you've been on that 20 daily for months, I will go down slowly. The fastest I would go is down to 15, a couple weeks later down to 10, a couple weeks later down to five, because why make this harder on you than it has to be, right? Um, I developed avascular necrosis in my shoulder years after. Was this due to steroids? You know, we can't prove that, but we tend to think so. That's why I say to the patients, you could get this after one dose. You could get this after 10 years. It can happen any time. You know, uh, are there other causes of avascular necrosis? Sure. But I guarantee when you went to that orthopedic doc, one of the first questions out of their mouth was, have you been exposed to prednisone or corticosteroids, right? Because it is a common culprit. Just like prednisone is easily in the top three culprits for um, osteoporosis, iatrogenic osteoporosis. Like we are causing osteoporosis with these medications. We're causing a lot more avascular necrosis than would, than would occur naturally. naturally. Um, and again, shoulder, good example. I didn't mention that, right? Hip is the most common, but it can happen to any of these bones where they meet a socket joint and there's tenuous vascular supply where if you shut down just one vessel, you can kind of lose really the nutrient supply to the bone. Um, are there medical alert bracelets for people in long-term steroids? Oh, you bet. We can make a medical alert bracelet for anything. But absolutely, the more common one is for people who have something called Addison's disease, right? Which means that they naturally don't make enough steroid when they're ill. And so um, you could get one even that says sort of like a, you know, drug induced, but we can put anything we want on a medical alert bracelet. So, I mean, you know, it's a, you can make your own even, right? You could go to the jeweler and say, I want this put on here. And it's, it is a very important thing to do. You know, if you're somebody who is taking, I'd say anywhere north of 20 milligrams, of prednisone daily, um, and if you would suddenly, in a crisis, end up in a hospital without, and no one has access to your medical history or medical records, and they don't replace that for you, you you could have basically all these things we're talking about, low blood pressure. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's a reasonable thing to put on a medical alert bracelet. You could put that, you could put that you're immune compromised, you know, anything you want, you can put on there. Um, I've noticed, you know, more recently, at least my iPhone, when I updated it, also has a feature about medical history, which is kind of neat. And I know the EMTs around here sort of will look at that. So if you happen to have your phone with you, but the medical alert bracelet is, is a great idea. Um, uh, spondylosis, age certain ways, you bend the neck. Yeah, spondylosis is an aging thing too, but um, there's no doubt if you've had a myelitis attack in your cord, might that also set you up for earlier or more symptomatic neck pain or, or back pain, yeah, perhaps, right? Because that's now your, that's now your you know, sort of weak spot um, for lack of a better description. And so um, this is something where the imaging can help, right? Um, it, it's, uh, many of you might know this from the trials, it was very hard to adjudicate attacks. And one of the reasons it was so challenging to figure out if patients in the NMO treatment trials were having attacks is because of these side effects. So I'll give you an example, a personal example from my practice. Um, one of my patients was on long-term um, 20 milligrams of prednisone daily. And so in the midst of the trial, she phoned up and said, oh my gosh, I can't move my leg really well. It's really painful. And as you know, sometimes those cord attacks, especially in NMO more than say MS are very painful. And she called me up and I said, oh boy. So I got the MRI set up. Um, I brought her in and the blinded examiner at my site did the exam and said, yeah, you know, there's a lot of pain. There's some weakness here. The pain's so bad, I can't tell about the weakness. It turned out she had a sacral insufficiency fracture from the osteoporosis but right in that area that we couldn't tell if it was cord or not. So whenever there's a question, is this arthritis? Is this aging? Is that, you know, at the MRI, you get a twofer, right? We can see um, 
what your, your vertebral bodies are doing. We can see if there's bad tightening or, or stenosis, and we can also check on the health of the cord and make sure there's not a subtle attack. Um, um, I'm currently decreasing my steroid taper. Oh yeah, and your doctor's doing a nice slow taper, it sounds like. And yeah, absolutely, if you run into trouble. I, I don't know a doctor that would get mad if you send him a message and you say, hey, I got really bad symptoms, so I just held at this dose for a couple days. I'm gonna continue my taper as soon as I can, right? We don't want people to suffer with this and everyone's different. Everyone responds to prednisone exquisitely uniquely. And so it's so hard to predict, which is why I give my patients a little leeway with sort of a goal end date and say like, I don't care how you get there, do it how it works for you kind of thing. Um, let's see here. Any other? These are great questions. Um, so we talked a little bit about withdrawal um, and the three big concerns, right? The osteoporosis concern, the infection concern, um, we didn't talk too much about the infection concern outside of, of the Bactrim. If you're allergic to Bactrim, we have other medications we can give to prevent uh, the pneumonia. Um, and it's a sneaky pneumonia, by the way. You might not know you have it for a while. Um, there are obviously other infection concerns as well on both prednisone and all of the therapies um, that we use for NMO, perhaps with the exception of IVIG, um, but every other therapy that we use to treat comes with an infectious risk. Um, also comes with um, um, one thing we always worry about too is um, skin cancers. Are we unmasking skin cancers? Like the analogy of unmasking um, diabetes, you should be getting, if you're on these immunosuppressives, annual dermatologic checks as well. That's one of the ones that, gosh, if we come in and we have so much to talk about, I sometimes forget to mention that during the visit. Certainly we unmask a lot of skin cancers. We can hasten their development. Um, um, a question, have a large lesion in my brain, but none in the spine, could they develop over time? If it's true NMO, uh, uh, antibody positive NMO, it's always a possibility, right? Um, and, and I have this question come up sometimes when a patient comes in to see me with a new diagnosis, say of aquaporin 4 positive, um, NMOSD, but really their presenting symptom was, was a mild optic neuritis from which they've had great recovery. And then I sort of lay out and talk to them about all of these treatments. And I say, we're gonna to plan to do these indefinitely, you know, lifetime, if you will. And the patient kind of looks at me like I have two heads. Um, and, I, and then, you know, I usually take a step back and I say, look, you know, you know in, the, in the sort of scale of <laughs> fortunate to unfortunate, yes, you have this condition, let's acknowledge that, but boy, you had a mild attack. And then kind of talk to them about the fact that we cannot predict attacks in, in either aquaporin 4 or MOG, we cannot predict when they will occur. You could have two weeks between your next attack. You could have two decades. We can't predict that with any degree of certainty. And we cannot predict the severity and the location. These are areas that we need to do more research on. This is what we're looking at biomarkers on. And, and the Samara Project actually just funded our group at Utah to look at biomarkers in pre-attack um, specimens to see if there's any way to help us predict, do any sort of inflammatory markers go up to give us a hint that an attack might be on the way? So thanks to the foundation for that. Um, I'm a super responder to me. I've been on Retux since 2015, but now say I'm a Retux failure if you've had three attacks. Yeah, these are great questions, right? We're talking more about management, less about prednisone, but <laughs> um, this can happen again. Right, when we get, this is a story, you know, we just looked at our population. We did a retrospective look at our population here in Utah. Um, and we dove into the data and it's very enlightening because what we think we know as physicians from our anecdotal day-to-day -day experience gets called to the table when we do real data analysis, right? And so, um, you know, our patients did well overall, which was great to see. Um, but I think we have a tendency to pat ourselves on the back as physicians and patients, when we get you on a therapy and you go for several years without an attack, um, and then you suddenly have an attack. <laughs> was it because you weren't gonna have an attack in, during that time anyway? Um, or was it because, again, the therapy failed? Or, you know, did you develop antibodies against, you can develop actually neutralizing antibodies against um, some of these monoclonals like rituximab. It's rare, but it can happen. Um, you know, we don't know. So when you go for 10 years, you know, and things are going smoothly, smooth sailing, you know, I just had a couple of those visits yesterday in clinic. It's like, great, you know, we didn't have a ton to talk about. We just talked about developments and research. Um, you know, but I've had, you know, when we did this review, I found a couple of patients who are mycophenolate mofetil for over 10 years without a single attack. And then right in the window of when we did the data, 
mining both had an attack and a bad attack. And, you know, so it really makes you give pause. And, and you know, and I quizzed them, you know, were you able to, did you miss any doses? And they didn't. They were, you know, they were able to, to take the doses really with tremendous reliability. And so then you kind of go, well, what happened? And it's, it's, it's difficult to know. We check all the data we can with rituximab. If somebody breaks through, um, I will immediately check their B cell level, CD19 and CD20 levels, to make sure they're not a fast metabolizer and the drug was actually out of their system. This happens occasionally. I will check neutralizing antibodies to see if they have them. Um, but often we come up empty-handed with an answer and then we just discuss, okay, treatment failure, time to move on. Um, does anyone know why it happens in the first place? Why we get NMO? No, you know, it's probably, I think uh, a lot of us tend to say the same thing and it's based in science, but it's vague sounding, which is you inherit a genetic susceptibility to autoimmunity, right? And, and certainly this is, we, we take a, a pretty good family history, right? When we, when we're diagnosing NMO and often we'll get at least some thyroid autoimmunity in the family, sometimes some lupus or Sjogren's or myasthenia. Um, and so we know that there's a bit of a genetic susceptibility to autoimmunity in general. Then the NMO patients tend to be really like the one in a million, both population wise, but within their family, right? They got the NMO. They didn't get the myasthenia. They, well, sometimes they get them all, but you know what I mean? Um, and so we do think there's also probably a trigger, right? And we base this on twin studies in all autoimmune conditions, identical twin studies. What percentage of the time when one twin has a condition, does the other twin get it? Because you presume that at least coming into the world, they had the same DNA. Um, and then they had different environmental exposures and you get into this whole field of epigenetics. But the short answer is we're not sure, but you probably need to have a minimum genetic susceptibility and you probably need to have something to have triggered that. And that something could be any number of things, including importantly, in the autoimmune neurology world, emotional trauma, because that does things to the immune system we don't understand. And so many of my patients have had their first attack of autoimmunity in the setting of emotional trauma, not just an, a, an infectious trigger. Um, oh, this is a good, oh, back to prednisone. Great, Brianna. All right, <laughs> we'll get back on task. I've, I've been on high dose. Um, whoa, 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 this call is going, going, going crazy there. 75 milligrams of prednisone since June. We are starting to taper down. How long after will I stop seeing the effects of the steroids thinning in the skin, fat deposit, excess hair growth, pressure in the eyes? It's going to take a lot longer than you want it to is sort of the short answer. So again, don't rush the taper. Pay attention to your body each time you go down a dose. Know that it will be a two to three days of fatigue and achiness. Um, so, and, and again, this is that, you know, the thinning of the skin, if you don't have to go back on prednisone, it will eventually recover. But, you know, you know, might it be, you know, a year, months, you know, we're talking months to, you know, a year, same, same with really all of these things. Um, they will eventually slow down um, because it's hopefully just sort of the one time exposure. Um, and again, then there's the differentiation, any weight puffiness that you have that's that's what we call the water weight. The effect of the corticosteroid will go away as the dose comes down. Um, usually by the time you get to five or 10, it's, it's almost, you know, you, you, you can feel that you're recognizing your, what you think of as your normal face again, but um, any weight that's from the extra calories because it makes you hungry and prednisone affects gluconeogenesis has to come off the hard way. You know, dieting, calorie counting, all of it. Um, um, Sometimes they get them all. Story of my life, yes, yes, I have many patients that have multiple autoimmunity. Again, when I meet an NMO patient, I tend to screen for a whole bunch of things. I check B12 levels for pernicious anemia. I check the hemoglobin A1C, make sure we're not brewing a diabetes. I check the thyroid and the thyroid antibodies, all of it, because it's so common that autoimmunity begets autoimmunity within the individual. Um, uh, lupus, Sjogren's, you all, you all know this. These, these are These are... 10, 15, 20% of the time, people with NMO have one of the others. Um, I've been on 10 milligrams prednisolone for over five years with 175 azathioprine. I have ligaments tear in both shoulders. Is this due to steroids? Um, well, part of it, Naresh, depends um, on your age um, in terms of how frequently they'll scan you and do DEXA scan. Um, the ligament tears, again, I can't prove it in an individual, but we certainly know that this is associated with prolonged uh, corticosteroid use. So if you didn't have any other obvious cause and you're going, why do I have ligament tears? You know, if you're not sort of doing heavy, heavy sort of lifting and bench pressing or something crazy every day, then it's probably related. But, um, you know, we can't prove it in the individual just to say that 
we know that your risk of that happening was increased with the requirement for corticosteroids. Um, should we do any special screening for other family members? I don't. The, the question is, you know, if you have one child or family member with, with NMO, should you screen the other family members? I do not. Um, what I do is I say to my patients, you know, make your family aware that this is an autoimmune condition because after the first visit, they're going back to ask all the nosy questions. I say, call up the family um, or the next holiday Zoom meeting, you know, say, hey, my doctor really wants to know, does anybody have? And I will give them a list of conditions. Um, so I just tend to keep that tucked in the back of my head. And I, what I would say to, to your daughter's sister is, um, you know, your other daughter, if, if medical things come up, if you're ever not feeling well, if you go to the doctor, say, hey, I do want to let you know autoimmunity runs in my family, because then what that does is trigger the doctor to look at it through that lens. Um, and, and that's about it. But no special screening if they're not symptomatic. Um, because, you know, first of all, NMO hitting twice in one family is so incredibly rare. Um, uh, really, truly incredibly rare. Um, but yet, yeah, might there be other autoimmunity potentially? Um, and so should you go out and get a whole bucket of blood tests? I don't think so. But, you know, anytime you get a symptom, you know, you try not to, you try to balance being a bit of a hypochondriac and worrying all the time with just sort of caution. So I always say, if you're not feeling well, you go to the doctor, tell them there's autoimmunity in your family so that they can at least think that way, right? It plants the seed for your doctor and should trigger a slightly different diagnostic approach. Um, is it normal to be on a maintenance dose of 10 milligrams prednisolone when on mycophenolate? Um, you know, this is something that's based on a tax severity physician approach, um, it, whether or not, but certainly we have done this with some patients. If I've had patients on azathioprine or methylprednisolone or any other medication where we don't feel comfortable switching to what we think are maybe some of the higher efficacy medications, um, I will sometimes double up and leave a low dose of prednisone on. Um, this was, I did this a lot more historically um, uh, when, when we had fewer options. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, discuss it, you know, you know, just always quiz your doctors, right? Quiz them. Um, this is, you know, this is, this is what they should enjoy doing. This is their job. Ask the question, say, say, Hey, you know, um, I'm on both of these. Is that, is that the norm? You know, and, and let, you know, you should, this should be shared decision-making, you know, a hundred percent of the time it should be shared decision-making. The doctor lays out the options. You ask the questions, you make the final decision, right? So ask them, but, um, but have I seen that done? Yes. And it tends to be if a physician is, a, is concerned for a relapse on one agent alone, especially the oral agents, or if you've already had that occur, then they're going to try and put you add on prednisone at the lowest possible efficacious dose to minimize the side effects, but try to prevent and tax. Um, time for one more question, the boss says. <laughs> um, I see one. Is crunchiness in the neck along with neck pain at a certain angle assigned of spondylitis? Any treatment for it? So again, this would be exam, a good clinical physical exam to figure out if you have spondylitis or something else going on in your neck, and imaging. Um, if, if the doc sees any concerning neurologic exam findings um, or does provocative maneuvers and sees something concerning, um, then, then they'll probably recommend MRI imaging. Um, all right, I guess we're out of time, huh? Is that right? Listen, I hope this was helpful. Um, I know we strayed a little bit. There are still many, many things about prednisone. There's a lot of literature out there um, in the U.S., PubMed, gov is the source of all the sort of curated, um, high quality peer reviewed data. You know, you can search around on there. Like I told you the FRAX website for fracture prediction, F-R-A-X, that's free open to the public. I found it just by Googling, um, you know, and um, do all the things to prevent. Absolutely monitor there. We can mitigate so many of these effects. Just nudge your doc, your primary care doc, your neurologist, any of your docs, nudge them and say, I want to prevent the side effects. Let's do everything we can and and you know be proactive about it and it, it you know many patients do do fine on years of prednisone just have to be proactive and do all the prevention thank you so much take care everybody